So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, just so everyone is aware, we are recording this so that we can share it with those who couldn't join us this evening. But I'm Christy Eckstein. I'm the executive director of the Ohio Grape Industries Committee, and we're excited to have you guys join us for our first virtual tasting focused on winter whites. Very timely, as I'm sure we're all across the state. It's cold and there's snow on the ground. So what better place to be than inside our homes or somewhere with friends and family and trying some Ohio white wines and also some Ohio Proud or locally raised, grown, or processed products made right here in Ohio. So I'm going to give you kind of a little bit of background about tonight. First, everybody's done awesome at muting and you're welcome to leave your uh, camera on so we can see your beautiful faces or you can shut your camera off, whatever is easiest for you. Um, but we're going to follow along with our guest host this evening, Bruce Benedict, who's going to actually conduct the tasting. So hopefully you have your four wines and food there ready to go ahead and taste with us as we move along tonight. Um, we'll do the tasting for about 25 to 30 minutes. And then we'll have some question and answer time at the end. So I would ask everyone if you have questions along the way, feel free to put them in the chat box and I will relay those to Bruce as we get to the end and he'll be able to share his expertise with us. And then we'll be able to kind of conclude the tasting this evening and have everyone get back to whatever else they have planned. So at this point, it's my honor to introduce Bruce Benedict, who I had the pleasure of working with at the Ohio Department of Agriculture and the grape industries for a number of years. Bruce has spent more than 35 years um, working with Ohio wines in some capacity, whether it be at the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation, the Department of Agriculture, or the grape industries. And when he decided to retire a few years back. He always said his dream was to work at a wine shop because it, it wouldn't feel like he was really working. It was just a love and a passion. And he's fortunate enough to be at Meza Wine Shop in Westerville here in Central Ohio, a fabulous little wine shop that you can see in downtown Westerville right behind him. So he's gonna share his vast knowledge of wine and Ohio wines with us this evening. And at this, this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Bruce. Christy, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, to everyone, uh, cheers. I hope you have your wine in front of you. I'm gonna cover a lot of things. Again, as Christy said, if you have questions, please let her know. And um, even if we have to do it during the presentation, we'll figure it out if there's something you can't see or can't uh, understand. Uh, we're going to use tonight, we're using four wines. Well, excuse me, let me give you a little background. Christy did uh, give you a little bit. I am uh, presently retired from the Department of Agriculture, and I work at Meso Wine Shop uh, in uh, Uptown Westerville. Uh, we were closed uh, because of COVID from March of 20 through October of 21. And we did reopen as uh, retail only. We're no longer a wine bar. It was getting very, very difficult to staff, but she has transitioned to delivery and wine clubs and that sort of thing. So if you're in the greater Columbus area, we can have wine on your porch tomorrow. There's my Mesa commercial, but she's done a wonderful job at, uh, at doing that. And again, thank you very, very much to Christy and to the Ohio Grape Industries Committee. They are near and dear to my heart, as are uh, most of the people that, uh, that I'm familiar with that are that the wines we're using tonight. Uh, what I would like, we obviously have four particular wines and four particular different foods. There are some general things that I'm going to mention, and uh, you may not have the same thing, but that's the, the cool thing about this is that we can use a lot of different, and I'll try to hit a lot of different general matches between foods and wines and what tends to work and what uh, tends not to. Uh, again, having the opportunity uh, to get local things may take a little more time. It may take uh, a, you know a tad more investment but it's worth it there are some wonderful artisans wonderful f local uh, farmers uh, orchardists uh, bakers cheese makers uh, it, it's delightful uh, 
uh, to, and I have the opportunity through working with Christy, and I also do some other things that take me out into uh, Ohio, and it is uh, it's fun being able to stop at a winery, stop at a, a local cheesemaker. Uh, I may have been known to stop at a local brewery, and uh, it's all a lot of fun. The brewers here in Ohio have also done a great job. Um, let me uh, tell, give you a little bit of sort of general tasting notes, and I know this may be uh, old hat to some of you. Uh, the wines that I have, they are all, of course, as Christy said, white. I opened them or brought them out of the fridge about an hour ago. I guess it, it, it's one thing to, uh, uh, it's nice to have refreshing cold beverages, but be very wary of serving wine too cold. When it's ice cold, you can't smell it, you can't taste it. And yes, it's refreshing, but so is water or, or uh, uh, soda or anything like that. Let wine warm up a little bit. You can get the aroma, it matches better with the food, and it also, you can taste it better. All, almost all wines are at room temperature when they are evaluated, when they're judged. So don't, don't let that uh, get in your way. In fact, I would encourage it, warm it up, you know. Um, get yourself a good uh, waiter's corkscrew uh, you know, the electric ones are fun, but they break. The ones with the wing, uh, they also break and they're cumbersome. Learn to use a good waiter's corkscrew, and I think you'll be uh, happy that you, you can do that. Uh, have a, get a nice glass. Now, these uh, are just, it's called a, a restaurant, Riedel. Riedel's probably the most famous glass, wine glass maker in the, in the world. And um, this is a nice one. This is a white glass uh, used in restaurants. We used them here at the shop uh, when we served. Uh, I also have, and it isn't ideal, but it's pretty nice at my house because I don't break them. The stemless are cool. And uh, these little ones are very, very nice. And there's some bigger ones and they don't fall over as easily. They obviously can warm up faster. So you have to be careful with that with white but they're especially good with reds and um, it's uh, it's nice to have them. I, I'm, I'm uh, surprised and, and it's kind of fun. Lots of restaurants use some sort of stemless glass now and I think it's easier for them to deal with and it uh, and it works. You know, they're easier, they're easier to clean. They don't break as, excuse me, they don't break as easily. So uh, it's, it's a good thing. Now, that being said, having big, nice bowls on, on stemmed glasses does give you the opportunity to really appreciate the aroma of a wine, especially reds and aromatic wines that you really want to enjoy. So uh, that's always a, a fun way to appreciate wine. First wine we are going to use today is, and I hope I can uh, put this it is uh, the Kasichik, Kasichik Vineyards. Tony Kasichik is the owner in Geneva, Ohio. I'm, I'm tickled to call Tony uh, a, a dear friend, and um, he does a wonderful job. Uh, Medium-sized vineyard. I'm not remembering exactly how many acres. Almost all of his um, fruit is uh, a state grown, although he does uh, buy some fruit locally. And uh, this uh, wine that we're going to start out with is his unoaked Chardonnay. And the uh, food, and this is, I don't know if you can see all this or not. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to wait and try to get a picture of this later. I've got the foods that I'm matching uh, this with and we are matching Tony's delightful Chardonnay with Khan's potato chips. Khan's is uh, an Ohio company. They started in Zanesville. 
There are two others that come to mind, uh, chip companies, uh, Mike Sells, which is, I think, Springfield or Dayton. Uh, Christy will correct me if I'm wrong. And Balrikes, which is in Tiffin, I believe. Those, they are good local companies. They have uh, always been very cooperative and enthusiastic about doing um, Ohio Proud projects and, and food, and in fact helped us to do a thousand pound bag of uh, potato chips at the Ohio State Fair about 15 years ago, which uh, I still think that I've got grease in my pores from that. Um, the reason we're using potato chips with this, uh, this Chardonnay, unoaked Chardonnay tends to be uh, a little crisper than, than Chardonnay that has uh, been in, stored in, in wood. And it also uh, probably, Tony didn't put this all through a secondary fermentation called malolactic fermentation. And so you get a nice crispness you also have real nice fruit, which there may be a teeny bit of residual sugar, but that fruit and that teeny bit of residual are what kind of uh, match with and uh, pop in your mouth when you're having something salty like chips. You also could have um, things like popcorn. Uh, you could have... Um, we're going to get into cheese later, but uh, possibly um, summer sausage, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, preserved meats that also have a, a decent uh, amount of salt and you need that fruit and, and make even something a little sweeter than this would, would work just fine. Um, just a little aside about Chardonnay. Chardonnay is a grape that, of course, is one of the most widely planted grapes on the earth. And part of the reason, and, and winemakers love it, because it can be made in lots of different ways. This is a real nice example of an unoaked Chardonnay. It's crisp, it's light, it's got nice um, tree fruit, peach, pear, apple on the nose and on the mouth. And it, uh, it's just a refreshing and delightful wine. Chardonnay can also be made, and I'm sure most of you have had uh, California Chardonnays that are very, very oaky, very oak forward, if that's a word or phrase. Those are good. They are good. They tend to match with a different type of food. Um, and and uh, that style, while very popular for a lot of years, is waning a little bit because it was a little over the top. Um, another style is Chardonnay that has been uh, put through malolactic fermentation. The malic acid through a secondary fermentation has been turned into lactic acid. That's the same acid that's in milk or dairy products. Thus, you've heard Chardonnay described as buttery or creamy, that's why. Also, that can be a style that you can have without having uh, oak influence on it also, which is fine. You know, everybody likes a different thing. I enjoy a big, buttery, gooey Chardonnay like that on Thanksgiving when I have a big, buttery, gooey turkey. And it's, I think that's a delightful sort of food match. It just, it brings out a lot of good things in each of them. So I think that's um, something worth remembering in that uh, they're different, but yet they can be manipulated. And I mean, manipulate in a good way. It, it gives that winemaker an opportunity to do what he or she would really like to do and express. So I'm going to move on to the next uh, wine, and excuse me if I get out of the shot for a bit. The next one we are going to, um, there we go, it's Nick Ferrante's uh, Gewurztraminer, and the label is kind of a cute uh, label that he's done for his Gewurztraminer and his Gruner Veltliner, 
and uh, it's in a German style or the Rhine, the Rhone bottle. And uh, Nick has always done a good job with his Gewürztraminer. Uh, it's uh, locally grown. I mean, it, in fact, he grew it. And I'm going to have a little in my uh, stemless glass. And we're going to match this Gewürztraminer with. I've got two apples. I haven't cut them up because I wanted you to see them uh, fresh and clean. Both of these are from Lynn's Orchard, uh, just east of Columbus. Uh, their address is Patascala, I believe. And the first one is an Evercrisp, and the second apple is a Gold Rush. These are two absolutely wonderful Ohio apples. The Evercrisp is a cross between a Honeycrisp and a Fuji, and it combines the best parts of both of those and is a lot easier to grow, and uh, uh, it keeps forever in a, in a relative sense. Both of those apples were, were picked, I believe, in late October, and they're still fresh and crisp right now. The Gold Rush is a very dense, tart, flavorful apple that um, actually a bag that's identical in size to say Golden Delicious or uh, Gala weighs 20% more if it's Gold Rush. It's dense, it's heavy, but it's extremely flavorful. It cooks very well. It makes absolutely dynamite cider for those of you that like that and often uh, local um, Orchard of Cider Producers will produce it out of uh, Gold Rush alone. I encourage you to go to places like Lynn's. They are open once a month in the off season. Uh, Legend Valley, my, my good friend uh, Bob Sage in Chardon, Ohio is open year round and uh, they're just nothing like getting local apples. Converse Dreamer. Gewürztraminer is uh, a grape, and you can tell by the name, it had its origin in Germany or in that part of the world. And Gewürztraminer is a spicy, has an, has an interesting aroma, just it gives you a little bit of spice. Uh, it's usually made in a lighter style that may have a bit of residual sugar left in it, but it handles that very, very well. Uh, it also has very, very nice acid, is a little puckery, and that's a, a very good thing because it, um, it just is, is a, and it goes real well with both of these very flavorful apples. It would also work with other fruits. It would also, of course, work with the other sort of the saltier snacks and that sort of thing. Um, it's it's also when it warms up, and that's the part of the thing about Gewürztraminer and lots of these whites is when it warms up, it just smells delightful, and it has a wonderful aroma, wonderful nose, and uh, it, it always um, it tastes and smells, and almost every uh, description you'll read of, of Gewürztraminer says it uh, smells and tastes like lychee nuts. Well, have you ever had a lychee nut? I doubt that many of you have. And one day, my my son, who for a long time uh, sold uh, beer and wine uh, here in town for a distributor, he, he had stopped at Whole Foods and he said, "Dad, I've got lychee nuts here. We got to taste them." Well, they're sort of like a you kind of peel them. They're a little bit like a legume, and they do. They have some flavorful uh, aspects to them, a little bit of spiciness, and uh, it's it's a fun thing. So it's. It's always good to know what when you describe something that you actually know what that descriptor is like. Um, I don't think I'll cover anything more about uh, Gewürztraminer, but and, and Gewürztraminer is not widely, widely planted, but there is uh, a good bit along Lake Erie. Uh, the other grape that I would mention that is very similar and we probably have more acres of it than Gewürztraminer is a grape called Tremonette. 
Travinet is a clone or a cross, excuse me, a hybrid of Gewurz Traminer. That's thus the name, Gewurz Traminer Traminet. There's lots of nice Traminets, and I would encourage you, and they have a very similar flavor profile. So I'd encourage you to, to, um, to check that out and look for those. One thing I'm gonna, before I get to the Pinot Grigio, and, and I have to mention this, we have lots and lots of wineries in Ohio and lots of wonderful people running them, good business people. I am very, very biased toward those people and those winery owners, vineyard owners that are growing their own fruit or obtaining it locally. Nothing wrong with the people that, that are forced because of a lack of local supply to get it somewhere else. But to me, that's what you want. If it's Ohio wine, it needs to be grown here. Every good wine in the world started with a good farmer. And I like that. And I also like the fact that it encourages local agriculture, smaller niche agriculture, because growing grapes is, is, uh, has to be a labor of love because it's really hard. And uh, it's just something that I would want to encourage. And I know that the Ohio grape industries is also has a vineyard expansion program. And I know some of you may in fact be interested in that and or familiar with people that are. And I would encourage you to support them because that uh, that local grape grower, they need you. They need your support. They need your business, they need your money, they need your enthusiasm. So with that, I'm going to move on to the next wine, which is um, also from Ferrante. And this is uh, the Ferrante uh, Grand River Valley Pinot Grigio. This is, um, I'll, I'll be honest, it's one of my absolute favorite Ohio wines. Uh, it's been around for a long time. Nick makes it about as well as Pinot Grigio can be made. It's still very reasonably priced. I believe it's still under $15. And it is truly one of the better Pinot Grigios produced here in the United States. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, James Suckling, who was a wine writer that used to work for the Wine Spectator now has his own uh, I think newsletter and blog and, and uh, he reviewed a lot of Ohio wines and uh, this got a 90 or a 91, I'm not remembering. It was also best of show in the Ohio wine competition uh, held uh, at, uh, or at least uh, uh, put together by both the folks at Worcester at OARDC and the folks at Kent State uh, with their enology and viticulture program. This is as this is as good as a Pinot Gris as you're going to want to ever have. You know, it stands up uh, to the Italian, uh, to the to the French ones, and it's just beautiful. Uh, the food that we're matching this with today, and I hope you can see this. This is, and I will. It's a little hard to see the label. It's a cheese called Hull's Trace, H-U-L-L apostrophe S, Hull's Trace. Hull's Trace is made by Blue Jacket Dairy. Uh, Blue Jacket Dairy is located in DeGraff, Ohio, near Bell Fountain, Logan County. And, uh, and Hull's Trace in particular is made and has similar flavor characteristics to an aged ch cheddar. It's very good. It has some some uh, some of that aged nuttiness that uh, not as much as a Swiss, but uh, a little bit of that uh, earthiness and that sharpness that an aged uh, cheese will have. And Jim and Angel King are the proprietors of Blue Jacket Dairy. Former, uh, they used to milk cows. They decided to transition into cheese about 10 or 12, 12 or 13 years ago. They've been uh, Ohio Proud Partners ever since. They make uh, another Swiss-like hard cheese. They make chevs. They make quarks, which are soft uh, cow's milk cheese. 
they make cheese curds, which they supply to lots and lots of places that that do um, fried cheese curds and serve them on salads and and appetizers, and they're uh, they're pretty yummy. They they uh, they make a lot of, of very beautiful products. So, and and not, we're blessed here in Ohio to have uh, there's a one outside of Newark, Black Radish, uh, Googisburg, Broad Run, uh, Pearl Valley, lots and lots of wonderful cheese producers. Uh, of course, the last three that I mentioned are primarily Swiss producers over in so-called Amish country. And I believe Broad Run, those folks even uh, do the, the cheese company, and they also have a small winery, uh, at least they used to, uh, that, that where they sell uh cheese and wine. Uh, one thing I would mention in terms of, of matching cheese and wine, we always hear, oh, wine and cheese, that's the best pairing on the earth. It's, everybody has wine and cheese. Well, wine and cheeses are wonderful together, but the thing that has to be, uh, you have to be aware of and is cheese can have strong flavors. It can overwhelm some wine and you also uh cheese is also obviously by definition it's a dairy product it's it's gooey it's creamy it uh it needs something to sort of stand up to it and it needs uh, a wine that has some flavor has some good acid uh, maybe a little bit of residual sugar, but that acid and that flavor are what's going to stand up to cheese and be a good match for it, as opposed to, um, you know, something that would be, uh, that it would overwhelm or would overwhelm it when it's, we're talking about light cheeses. The, um, the last wine that we're going to show, excuse me here, is, oh, there we go, Debonet Vineyards, uh, Chalet Debonet, uh, from, uh, also from Madison, right on the Lake County, uh, Ashtabula County line. Tony Dubevic and his family, as a son that's in the business, he worked with his dad. They've been around, I think their technical anniversary was 50 years last year, 71. Uh, we're using his Riesling Reserve. Now, uh, Tony's Rieslings uh, have won many, many uh, honors throughout the, the country and world. and he, like most uh, Northern Ohio Riesling producers, Tony makes a couple different Rieslings. This one, his reserve is a little bit on the sweeter side. I believe he puts about, it's got some sweetness, still nice acid, about 4% residual sugar. He also makes a, a non-sweeter Riesling. He may even make a couple as does uh, most of the wineries up there. I know Nick Ferrante makes a couple different Rieslings. We can do Rieslings very well. We have a climate that is, um, it, it adapts to very well, excuse me. And, uh, but it, it is, um, it's a grape that um, it can be, again, very fruity has a lot of uh, sort of apple, pear, apricot, that sort of, uh, of uh, attribute to it. And it can be complex. You know, the, the good people in, in Germany regard Riesling just the way the French regard Chardonnay. They do a lot with it. They make different styles. They make everything from absolutely bone dry, uh, austere, a lot of acid, uh, interesting table wines to um, dessert wines, both regular dessert that are just from ripe grapes to 
ice wines, which of course we make here in Ohio. Uh, usually we make them here with Vidal Blanc, not Riesling, but we uh, can do it in a very, very similar manner. And they make absolutely nectar-like dessert wines. And, uh, and I might mention that uh, we didn't use it tonight, but sweeter foods. And tonight we are, uh, the food that we're matching with the Riesling is, uh, if I'm doing this, it's Mrs. Turbo's Cookies. And they are from uh, Powell, Ohio, which is just north and west of Columbus. Here's the, the cookie itself. And it I, I won't eat it while we're on together, but it may disappear after we're done. Um, and this is a naked sugar cookie. I also have some that have some icing on them, and and uh, they are delightful cookies. We have a lot of, of good cookie, pastry, cakes, local bakers, uh, local artisan um, food producers that I think it, you would be uh, well served to to have those. The whole idea of having sweet foods, desserts, if you will with wine is an interesting one and sometimes it's one that people don't think of but yet you know and we're not talking about i've got you really can't see it but i've probably got an ounce or so of of wine and uh that's all you need sometimes just a little sip something to go with that nice cookie with a nice piece of pie a nice pastry uh shortbread if you'll those of you that might be uh Ted Lasso fans on Apple TV. Ted makes those little shortbreads for his boss. And again, that's sugar and flour and uh, butter. And uh, they're, they're pretty good. Now, the fact is just a little bit of, of, uh, of that sweet, nice dessert wine, which of course can be usually best enjoyed all by its, excuse me, all by itself. It benefits also from a nice, little piece of dessert that I think you'll enjoy. Um, and so sweeter wines like this Riesling uh, can really, and that also some of the, the middle of the road Rieslings go really well with salad, with appetizers, with uh, uh, they do provide just a real nice uh, opportunity to enjoy um, uh, white wines and to enjoy desserts. Now, we didn't do it tonight, but I assume at some point we'll do reds, but uh, reds can be a wonderful uh, accompaniment to dessert. And the one that is still my favorite and most fascinating to me is when you have a piece of chocolate cake or a flourless tort or something almost big and gooey and chocolate and have it with a big dry red wine. And for whatever reason, that's just one of those things that doesn't sound logical, but it is a fabulous sort of taste treat. And um, it's, a, it's, it's something that I think when you try it, you'll save it when you're uh, having a, a nice red with your steak. You'll probably save a little and have it with that chocolate cake uh, after, uh, after dinner. So uh, with that, I would say that... Uh, uh, I, again, I appreciate you all uh, coming and, and, and getting on the call here. The, in general, I think what I would, would say to you, um, try out different foods, different wines. You know, there's no magic, despite the fact that I think some go well with each other, some don't. But... Um, it's sort of what you like, but I think you can enhance by doing things that are optimal. And the, it really gives you a chance to, it's a nice way to entertain. It's a nice way to support local businesses. It's a nice way to support Ohio agriculture. And so all those things sort of fit into, um, uh, you know, the, the, the kinds of experience that, that, that you would want to have. 
Christy, I'm uh, open for questions if if that's uh, if we're ready for that. Yeah, I, there aren't any in the chat box, but if anyone wants to type a question in the chat box or if you want to unmute your microphone and ask a question, that's perfectly fine sure, too. Sure, sure. Was there anything you can think of that I didn't cover, Christy? No, I think you covered everything from glasses one, one to One thing that I, that I would mention, and part of the reason that we did something, Christy, when did we do the last, uh, that I did the last tasting? Was it last summer? Yeah. But well, we did it with the VIP um, ambassadors. Right. We did it in the fall. Around Halloween, fall. we did Halloween candy. And we did we Halloween candy. And, and I guess what I would say to you that part of, yes, wine goes wonderfully with a, you know, a grilled sea bass or a delicate steak Dion or, you know, a wonderfully prepared uh, veal or chicken. That's fabulous. But don't overlook, it's part of the reason we do this, when you sit down to have a pizza or potato chips or uh, some cheese and crackers, you know, uh, some of the most pleasant memories. My children are 40 years old in a few months, but when they were small, we would go to Lake Erie uh, and sitting out with a, a nice uh, lighter uh, Ohio wine and having uh, cut up pieces of cheese and uh, summer sausage. It just doesn't get a whole lot better than that. And so it's something that uh, trying to be you know, a lot of these wines are delightful if you have them in a casual way. Yes, Bruce is exactly right. There is no wrong answer. There's no perfect that you can only drink white wine or a specific wine with a certain pair of food. There's no wrong answer. So I think we do have a question here. Sure. Um, if you have a dry Riesling, would your food pairing be different instead of the Riesling reserve that we use tonight? That is an excellent question. Yes, I, I think it probably would be. Um, dry Riesling is a is an interesting, you know, there aren't a lot of them, or at least we don't tend to think of them. I think you would use it and it would match real well. It could match well with meals like chicken and fish because that dry Riesling probably has pretty good uh, acid. And so that acid is what you want, you know, when you have, you know, fish that's done in a cream sauce or a uh, steak that is, you know, has a lot of fat and a lot of flavor. You know, the, that, that acid, that, uh, that's what sort of stands up to and matches those those things. So that's a good question. I think uh, salads, even though you do have to be careful, you know, when you have vinegar and oil, remember what vinegar was at some point. It was grape juice or apple juice or something like that that has now been put through a process to make it into vinegar. That sometimes doesn't have a real good matching effect, but a lighter salad with maybe a blue cheese or a ranch or even a thousand islands, something like that. Uh, uh, even lighter fruit salads, egg salad, chicken salad, that sort of thing. I think that's a great match with uh, with drier Rieslings. And and we've got some beautiful ones. Tony uh, DeBevic makes a dry Riesling that I think is just his normal Riesling. Uh, Nick Ferrante makes one called Golden Bunches which has been around, gosh, I think the best part of more than 15 years, got best of show in San Francisco near uh, about 15 years ago. But it's just one, it's again, that's one of those two wines are some of Ohio's standard bears. They're fabulous. So Bruce, when talking about acid, which you've talked about a lot tonight, please describe what an acidic note is like. What is what does that mean? What is that? So, like? Thank you, Christy. Um, acid, uh, all wine contains uh, acid. Uh, it starts usually with, with, as I said, sometimes even with citric, but with citric and malic acid. And boy, I wish I paid more attention in chemistry 
to, so I can explain this just a little more precisely, but um, that acid is, it produces that sort of lip smacking uh, sensation that you get with, with a good wine. And I know you're thinking, oh, Bruce, I don't want to, I don't want to have acid in my wine. Yes, you do. Because it balances out both the fruit and sometimes the sugar and a good wine, even a good ice wine, which is unbelievably sweet. It still has good acid content and it makes it feel right in your mouth and it makes it, it, it enables it to, to match with the food. You know, part of, and, and it can be tricky and it can be manipulative in a bad way, there are California wineries that they work so hard to get extraction. You know, they want big, big color. They want big, big flavor. They want over the top things. And so they add acid back after they finish making their wine. So, you know, some, sometimes we don't want acid and some, you know, some of the most highly advertised wines uh, around now probably don't have very good acid and they don't uh, to my mind they're a little too manipulated but good acid in wine gives you that little bit of a lip smack and it enables that uh, wine and sweetness wine and fruit to be balanced okay so speaking of ice wine any pairing tips for what you would pair with ice wine ice wine and again, uh, and I tell this this little story back uh, a long time ago when I first started being interested in wine. There was a, a little guidebook that had listed wines and the food that they were best with. And this particular listing was a late harvest German Riesling, which would taste very similar to a uh, an ice wine. It could be tasting also like a French Sauterne, also very, very rich, expensive ice uh, dessert wines. And it said uh, a simple butter cookie, if you must. So in other words, it's best by itself, but that little butter cookie, uh, a, a little uh, a sugar cookie like I have here, uh, a little shortbread, that you've seen, you know, the, the British do a lot of shortbread, something simple, uh, baklava, uh, a, a, a nice lighter uh, pie, or or possibly a lighter cake. You wouldn't, I don't think you'd want uh, carrot cake or uh, what's the red, uh, red velvet, that kind of thing. They'd probably be better with something bigger, but something lighter uh, is a real, real nice, and it's an elegant dessert. And it would, you know, really nice if you want to entertain. So have you been to M Cellars that one of our, our guests um, likes M Cellars, which is a fabulous I wine. Not, I've met Cellars. Matt and I've, and I've, I think it's been about 10 years. I've stopped by and it was pretty crowded. I didn't get a chance to chat with them, but I know they do a wonderful job. There's some, some, some of our wineries, and some of the new ones, and some that I uh, unfortunately have not had a chance to become acquainted with, are doing wonderful jobs in the vineyard, and then they're making that into some gorgeous wines. So, you know, I'd always encourage you to obviously stop and patronize, but get to know the folks, you know, talk to them about the grapes, talk to them about the wine, have an interest. It's they, they like most good winemakers and viticulturists, grape growers, they want to talk about it. They're tickled that you want to know. And so take the chance to do it if you, if you have the time and if they have the time. Sometimes they're awful busy during the, the peak times when they're uh, doing things in the vineyard or in the uh, cellar. And uh, but but it's really it's really fun. And there's some really beautiful uh, places. So are there, it, it looks like someone might be typing, but while Kevin is typing his question, 
I think one of the questions I always have is cooking with wine. I know Bruce has taught me that we should cook and drink the same, the same wine that we're cooking with. So Bruce, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that is, you know, while that's not, it's true certainly almost every time. If you're going to be making, you know, using uh, wine to cook with, Generally, the wine you're cooking with is the wine that you might want to match that dish with. I'm thinking of, of uh, pork roast, and um, there's a beautiful pork recipe that calls for pork, uh, sauerkraut, apples, potatoes. Uh, it's a crock pot recipe, and it's just absolutely wonderful. You can use uh, Gewürztraminer, you can use Chardonnay, you can use Vidal Blanc. For that matter, you can use a lighter red, like a, uh, here in Ohio, you might want to use a Chamberson or a, a Mar Marquis or Marquette. I always get those mixed up. Uh, maybe even a Frontenac but, uh, or a Pinot Noir. Some of the Pinot Noirs are just uh, beautiful, and we're doing a few, uh, certainly along the lake, and I'd encourage you to try them. But, and, and, you know, don't, it's almost hard to find anymore. Used to, the grocery store would have something and it was labeled as cooking wine. Well, it had it had salt added to it, so you couldn't drink it. It could only be cooked with. Now, that was so that uh, your youngsters, that was back from a time where prohibition was a more popular thing thought and unfortunately it still pops its ugly head up once in a while but um just if if you're going to be using a lot to cook with you know i wouldn't buy uh, uh, uh an 80 dollar burgundy to cook with i'd uh, pick out something a little more reasonable at your local wine shop or your local winery but then uh you know it still it, it imparts flavor and uh, and it's a nice way to use as a liquid, uh, better than even water or whatever else, or fruit juice, you know, that sort of thing. So I, I think we had a comment about, we did tonight, um, it, it seemed like, and very true that we focused a lot on Northeastern Ohio wines. And the reason for that is one, um, we picked wines tonight that are a part of our Ohio Quality Wine Program which means that these wines are made from a minimum of 90% Ohio grown grapes, at least. Most of these or all of these are probably 100% Ohio grown grapes. Um, they've sure. also undergone a blind tasting um, and been awarded a silver medal or higher and also undergone chemical analysis. So that's the reason we selected the wines that we did this evening, but definitely um, it's in our future hopes to do more virtual tasting. So I did put in the chat box my email address. We'd love to hear theme ideas from you um, as we move forward. I think red wines are definitely in the future. Um, and then we would also like to focus on different areas of the state. So I know someone asked a question about what are some good recommendations for wineries in central Ohio. I would encourage you all to visit findohiowines.com and find an Ohio winery. The wineries are, you can search by region, you can search by wine variety, the amenities that they offer. Um, Bruce and I are, you know, probably going to not be biased and choose any one winery over the other with 370 plus wine manufacturers in the state there you're within 30 minutes um, to an Ohio winery anywhere you are in the state and again it, there really is no wrong answer um, you can find a winery that has dry that has sweet that has live entertainment that's pet friendly that has lodging that has re a restaurant um, so really it depends on what mood you're in and what you're doing um, and the experience that you're looking to have. There's, again, there's no wrong answer and you can visit multiple wineries in the same day and have a different experience at each one. So Bruce, I don't know if you have any more to add there. Well, and and, and I know we we were, we were uh, primarily uh, on Lake Erie and that's still our biggest growing area and, and a lot of wineries, but I would mention a couple that come to mind, uh, Mays Valley, which is, not only a, a wonderful winery, they've got a wonderful brewery. They have a beautiful farm market and a restaurant. Uh, it's a, they do a lot of things. 
uh, a little winery, which is close to Christy and I's heart. We both grew up close to their Dragonfly, uh, partway between Urbana and West Liberty. And they have a small vineyard, and that's the case with a lot of these. They have two or three or maybe four acres of grapes. But uh, Dragonfly, for instance, just does, it's an immaculate vineyard, and they do a wonderful job. And uh, here There's in Central Ohio, Rock, Rock, Rock Mills, Side and Lancaster. Yeah, Rock Side. Yeah. Um, Wine yeah, just some, yes, we need, some there, wonderful, a, wonderful places that, um, and, and this time of year can be a challenge sometimes, finding when they're open. Uh, I would certainly uh, check your website and check your uh, Stonecrest. One thing I would mention as a commercial for Mesa Wine Shop, we like carrying Ohio wine. We have varying amounts of it at any one point. Stonecrest Vineyard at Frazeysburg, Ohio. Mike and Cheryl run a wonderful vineyard and winery, and when we need wine from them, they're gracious enough, uh, and they deliver it. You know, local places, that's sometimes, um, you know, of that 350 wineries in Ohio, about 10 or 15 are distributed statewide. <laughs> so most of them are available at the winery, period. But that's part of the fun, and it's part of what uh, makes, you know, traveling around and investigating and uh, finding out about them uh, makes it fun. So I encourage you to do that. Well, Bruce, thank you for being with us and being our host this evening. We Bruce, thank, thank all of you. you for joining us. Um, I think the last question we have is, do we know anything about the wine and chocolate event in Southwest Ohio? And yes, there are several different trails across the state of Ohio, coordinated by our, our sister kind of organization, the Ohio Wine Producers Association. So there are um, some wine and chocolate events that are going on in times for Valentine's. Um, so over the next couple of weeks. So I would encourage you to visit ohiowines.org as well to see a list of their trail events, or you can contact the wine producer's office to get tickets for those trail events at 440-466-4417. So are there any other questions before we wrap up? Again, please, please send us your ideas for future tastings. Um, we would like to make this a series, so we'd love any ideas that you guys can send. And thank you for spending your Thursday evening with us and enjoying Ohio wines. Thank you very, very much. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>